We want to conclude tonight our series that we have called The Least of These. We're going to turn our attention to the Gentiles tonight. I'm going to explain what that means, but let me remind you of our theme verse for the whole series, Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Throughout our series, and you can catch it on the archives in case you've missed some of it, we have talked about Yeshua's ability to connect with and identify with the outcasts, those falsely accused, those falsely imprisoned, the hungry, the thirsty, the homeless, the sick. We talked about how Yeshua elevated all of these people, gave them value, brought them into his family, spent time with them, focused on them. He elevated women. He elevated children. He elevated slaves and servants. And then last week, Pastor Wayne brought a wonderful message called Yeshua's Brothers. And he pointed out that even Israel themselves were the least, and they had to be elevated by the Lord. You might say, well, that sounds a little critical, Pastor Chad. Why would you call Israel the least? Why well, didn't say it? Yeshua said it in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. It says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the peoples. So yes, even Israel was considered the least of these at one point until Yeshua said, I've given you a special calling, a covenant, a chosenness. I've given you a job to do. And tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that job is as we start to turn our attention to the Gentiles. In the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, the most commonly used word in Hebrew for Gentile is going to be goy, in the plural goyim. And you've heard this, this, uh, this word used in much of our language from our readings, even in some of our songs tonight. It means a Gentile, a heathen, a nation of people, and anyone who is not Jewish or from a Hebrew descent. So you can understand that that wording has a little bit of flexibility inside of it, Right? It doesn't only define one specific type of person, but a group of people, and that group can vary depending on its context. It can mean a pagan nation on one hand, and on the other hand, it can be a group of unbelievers. On one hand, it can be anyone non-Jewish, but on the other hand, it can be a non-Jewish believer. It can still mean Gentile. Romans chapter 11, and if you're in your Bibles tonight with me or in your devices, I would encourage you to stay somewhere between John, Acts, and Romans, because that's where a lot of this is going to take place. If you can find that location, you won't have to turn far. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. I'm talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Now, when we look at Romans, we're talking about the Greek writing here. And the Greek usage of the word Gentile is ethnos, right? You understand where that's going to go. That's ethnicity is the root of that. It's an ethnos, and it means a Gentile, a pagan, or a nation of people. Again, has a little flexibility in it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. And here, this phrase, babbling like the pagans, a slightly different word for the Gentile is used here. Ethnikos has a similar root, but instead of ethnos, it's ethnikos. It means Gentile, a pagan, but can also mean a foreigner from anyone outside of Israel. So what did we narrow down? Well, if we're talking about someone who's a Gentile, we are certainly talking about someone who's not Jewish. That would be the first easy definitional line we can draw. In some cases, we may be talking about a foreigner or a pagan type person, someone who worships a pagan God, but not always. We don't always have to mean that. And the reason I bring this up is because I've talked to people 
and spoken to them over the years, and I've noticed a trend that there are some people who no longer want to be called Gentile because they say that means pagan. Well, it can mean pagan, but it's not the only meaning that it has. It can actually just mean someone who's a believer and not Jewish. It can be a Gentile. Paul addresses them himself. Remember back in Romans 11 that I just read, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. That's not unbelieving Gentiles, that's believing Gentiles. I'm speaking to you saved by Yeshua, believing new covenant Gentiles. And he's using it in a positive way. He's not using it in a negative way. And so you're gonna see multiple usages of that. And I don't want you to get locked into any one use. I want you to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit and listen to the context of the scriptures because it will teach you properly how to interpret the word of God. Now, we know that the Gentiles will look down upon as much as the Jewish people were looked down upon. You know, even the phrase Hebrew is not a positive term in its origin, right? If you go back and learn the origin of this word, even using that terminology was not intended to be positive in its origin. And lest we get too puffed up, remember back in Deuteronomy 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you and he did not choose you because you were more in number than other people, for you were the least of all people. Did you get it? God chose you, Israel, because you were the least. So the next time any of us are tempted into pride, that we're so good, that we're so gifted, that we're so talented, that God had to choose us. Just remember this scripture. I did not choose you because you were so good. I chose you because you were the least. And all of a sudden, the next time somebody speaks to you and they say, man, God has chosen you. You're not sure if that's a compliment or not. Did he choose me because I was the least or did he choose me because I have this destiny and calling? Well, yes. Both. You have a God-created destiny, and all of us in the house were probably the least. It's a theme throughout the Bible. You know, when, when Samuel was told to go to Jesse's house, I'm pretty sure Samuel didn't think he was walking away from that house, having anointed the least in the family, King David. You know, or Gideon, when the Lord chose him, and he kept saying, but I'm the least of my family of the least of the tribes of Israel who are the least of the nations. You certainly have made a mistake. You don't mean me. God said, no, I mean exactly you. Because to the least of these, God can do miraculous things. And to the least of these, working through us, he gets all the glory. You see, when somebody is supremely talented and gifted, even by the hand of God, sometimes it can be confusing on who needs to get the glory. I think Satan struggled with this. My perception of Satan is that he was a supremely gifted and beautiful angel, an archangel, who struggled with understanding the difference between being talented and being chosen by God. God gave him the talent, but Satan abused that. And I don't want any of us to fall into that category. Remember, the next time the Lord chooses you, to be humble, say thank you for the gifting and the calling. And remember, he may not have chosen you because you were the greatest in the house. He might have chosen you because you were the least, like me. Now, we've defined what Gentile means for a second, but we also have scriptures telling us that at various times they were looked down upon, just like the Jews were in their past. I'll bring you to a passage in John chapter 4. Verse 7 through 10, I'm going to give you a couple of the words of Yeshua here. John 4, 7. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Yeshua said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, but you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Yeshua answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That's just one small example. We'll read a few as we move along. It's giving us a, a little window into how people viewed one another in ancient Israel. And what we know here is the Jewish people looked down upon the Samaritans. 
And in a lot of ways, the Jewish people looked down upon all Gentiles, anybody that wasn't Jewish. And the reverse is true. The Gentile pagan nations certainly looked down upon Israel. There's a lot of looking down upon. You you understand what I'm saying? A lot of looking down upon one another. And I wish that wasn't true today, but unfortunately it's still true. Even in religious circles, you'll have one group think that they're above the other group. The ultra-Orthodox don't think that the conservative are really worth much. Right? And the conservative would look at the reform and they would be like, ah, you guys don't really know what you're doing. And they all look down upon the messianics. That's not God's heart. God's heart is to value each person because each person was created by God specifically with a destiny. And God is building inside each one of us the tools needed to walk out that destiny. And therefore, as sons and daughters of the king, creator, we are all heirs of that kingdom. We should treat one another and look at one another in those light. Because when you see your brother and sister as a prince and a princess of the king, you won't look down upon them anymore. They have rights to the throne, rights to the kingdom, I should say. But here, we know that the Samaritans were looked down upon. John chapter 10, Yeshua says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. You see, the Gentile believers are being described there. They're being described as people who are in a different sheep pen. But we're called to be under one shepherd and in one flock, in one family. This is reiterated further in the book of Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 17, this famous passage about the engrafted olive tree where Jew and Gentile comes together. Romans eleven seventeen. 17, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, the you there, by the way, is to the Gentile. Although you, a wild olive shoot, Gentile, have been grafted in among the others. Notice it's a believing Gentile. Positive term, not a negative term. You, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Later in the same chapter, the word comes to the Jewish believers to be careful of being arrogant. Isn't that interesting that in the same chapter, the Gentile believers are engrafted into the family of God, but told, don't be arrogant. And the Jewish believers, the original, the natural olive branches, are also told, don't be arrogant. Why? Because as I taught you a few weeks ago, Yeshua has the capacity to elevate a group of people without diminishing another group. He can bring in the Gentiles without pushing down the Jews. And he can bring in the Jews without pushing down the Gentiles. He can bring in the women without pushing down the men. And he can bring in the children without pushing down the parents. That's why Yeshua can feed 5, 10, 15, 20,000 out of a few loaves and fish because he only knows how to give. It never goes away. He doesn't run out. He doesn't run out of love. He doesn't run out of wisdom. He doesn't run out of a plan. Come on, that needs to be an amen in the house. God doesn't run out of a plan. He doesn't get backed into a corner And then start looking around like, oh, guys, listen, my plan didn't work. And any ideas, anyone? God doesn't run out of a plan. And something I've been trying to hammer over and over during this series, especially about the relevancy of the word of God, is God didn't write the scriptures in hopes that it would work. He didn't write it in hopes that the prophecies would come true. He wrote it knowing the future, just simply telling us what it was going to do. He doesn't write the laws of God saying, hey, these might come into play. 
He writes his laws saying, I have seen the future. I will tell you what happens if you disobey this law. I'm telling you what's going to happen. I'm not trying to guess what's going to happen. And for those reasons, God's ultimate perfection of his word and his knowledge of the future, there's no need to change the scriptures. There's no need to update the scriptures and make them, quote, more relevant today than they were before, or to think that they were only culturally fitting from an, for an ancient time. No, God lives outside the creation of time. When he wrote the scriptures, he wrote them in present tense because that's where he lives. So you never have to worry about the scriptures being out of date or the principles of God no longer fitting the society because we're progressing in our mind. God was already there. He's already been ahead of all the progression we're gonna make and that's when he wrote these scriptures that fit us perfectly. The Gentiles here are called the wild olive shoot. I'm sure we don't love the term wild there but it is an agricultural term. I wouldn't take it too far. I have from the, the place we just moved from had 25 olive trees on it. And one of the things that I learned when you're working with olives and olive trees and olive branches is if you take a branch from one tree and you fuse it with another tree that's natural, over time, those two will fuse together. They will become one and the new branch will take nourishment up from the roots, up from the chunk of the tree, out to the branches, and it will actually continue to grow and produce fruit, even though it wasn't originally in the tree. But you want to know another interesting fact about it. The new branch will never look like the original tree. It grows fruit. It's healthy. It gets bigger. It has green leaves. It's healthy, but it never looks exactly like the original tree. Why? Why? Because God didn't make a mistake when he created it. He's not trying to fix a mistake by engrafting it. No, he's simply bringing two sheep pins together. Neither pin was a mistake. That's how we have to view the Gentile part of the body of Messiah. They weren't a mistake. They weren't left out of the covenant. God had a plan for them all along. Yeshua is the one who elevated the Gentiles, even to the point where his own disciples did not even catch this at first. They weren't even sure the value of the non-Jewish believers. They didn't know what to do with it. But God made a way for the Gentiles. God brought equal value, what we call distinctive value, to all people groups. Romans chapter 10, you should be close to there in your scriptures already. Look at verse 11 from Romans 10. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame for there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that word was new to everybody who heard it. You gotta think about the crowds of the Jewish people that would rally around Yeshua as he's giving parables and he's doing teachings and he's doing these amazing miracles. And you gotta think of the Gentiles who would love to get a glimpse of that because they've heard all the famous things. And they're behind the Jews and they're like, I'd love to see what's going on, but you know, I, I'm, I'm out of place here. This Messiah is a Jewish Messiah and he's only for the Jewish people. That was what they might have thought in those days. The Gentiles might have taken a step back. And then Yeshua says something like this. There's no difference. I'm going to save all of you. And now the person at the back starts to kind of gently push their way to the front. Wait, me too? Yes, you too. But, but I'm not Jewish. That's okay. I didn't make a mistake. I did an interview one time on TV and the the, the way the first question was phrased was a little bit odd, and so I answered in a way that was a little bit odd. And then the person doing the interview answered me back in a way that was a little bit odd. And I think we both realized that we needed to cut that out of the, the video. That didn't work very well. And the, what had happened was, and it was all friendly, it was kind of funny, but it just came across really odd and weird. And he said, 
how long have you been in Israel? And I, at that time, I told him how long I'd been in Israel. And he said, you know, what kind of a home did you grow up in? And I said, I said, uh, well, I grew up in a Jewish home, but I'm not Jewish. Because I thought it was kind of a weird question, and I didn't know what to, how to answer that question. So I, I thought I answered it deep. So I said, I grew up in a Jewish home, but I'm not Jewish. And he's like, brother, that's okay. I said, I know. And then we had this really weird moment. Like he was like, oh, did you, you think it's bad to be Gentile? And I was like, no, I don't. Do you think it's bad to be Gentile? Why are you saying that? This is a really weird thing. Cut, cut, let's start over. Bad interview. Listen, when Yeshua reveals something like this and he says, I'm the Lord who's gonna richly bless all who call upon me. And anybody from any background who wants that Step forward. This was a new message that brought liberty to so many people. And it elevated people who thought they were the downtrodden. They were the ones left behind. And Yeshua said, you're not left behind. Come into my kingdom. Become a prince and a princess. Gentiles were considered unclean, even by some of the disciples. Acts chapter 10, verse 28. And he said to them, of course, this is Cornelius and, and Peter going back and forth. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. You know, this is Peter talking to Cornelius now, the Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And all of a sudden, God got a hold of Peter and he said, Peter, I'm not sure what sermon you were listening to back when I was on earth, but you missed something. Peter. In the vision, the sheet comes down out of heaven. Peter is in his Jewish daily prayer time on the roof. And the sheet comes down three times and he's like, take this and eat it. Oh, it's unclean animals. And unfortunately, some people read that verse and they're like, oh, that's the verse that we use to say that there are no such thing as kosher laws anymore about eating food. And I'm just here to tell you that is not at all what that scripture is about. I'm not saying that you have to keep a kosher diet, especially if you're not from a Jewish background. Seek the Holy Spirit on that. See what he says to you about it. But in that passage, to that Jewish apostle, he was not talking about food at all. As a matter of fact, Peter is the one who interprets it right here. And he says, I had this vision, and through the vision, he doesn't tell me, what to eat and not eat. It's not even about that. Through the vision, verse 28, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter is having a heart change for the Gentiles. And he's saying to Cornelius, Cornelius, I'm so sorry, I missed the teaching. Somehow I missed it when Yeshua talked about it. Forgive me, Cornelius, thank you for welcoming me into your house. I would gladly come into your house now because you are not considered unclean by the Lord. You see, God's having to change hearts because he's elevating the Gentile without diminishing anyone else. Romans eleven eleven, our final verse tonight. Again, I ask, did Israel stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, again, positive term, come to the Gentiles, why? To make Israel envious. I hope you caught what that just said. Because you might remember in Matthew chapter 28, before Yeshua ascended into heaven, that he talks about this great commission and I have called you to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to teach the people everything I've taught you. And that's the Jewish Messiah in Israel talking to the Jewish disciples. It's a very Jewish commission. Now we understand that that commission was always meant to go beyond Israel. Of course it was. But lest a Gentile person feel left out of a commission... I'm giving you tonight the Gentile commission. Here it is. Gentiles don't feel left out. Because of the Jewish transgression, salvation has come to you because now you have a commission, Gentiles. Go make Israel envious of their God. Tell them what they've been missing. 
Tell them that they're missing blessing. They're missing healing. They're missing miracles. They're missing forgiveness and cleanness and joy. Go tell them all the stuff they're missing through Yeshua. And that becomes the Gentile's job. Do you understand? Guys, watch this. The small remnant of the Jewish believers in the New Testament were to preach the gospel outside of Israel to the world. Not everyone was going to believe, but a small remnant of Gentile believers came to faith, small by percentage on the earth. And those small remnant of Gentiles are now called to go preach to the larger family of Israel so that they might come to faith. Why? To reveal their actual original calling, which was, I'm choosing the the nation of Israel to teach the nations about the salvation plan of God. Small Israel remnant preaches to the small Gentile remnant who preach to the larger family of Israel, who preaches to the whole world. And the two become one. The engrafted vines are working together, getting the same nourishing sap, two pens under one shepherd. We become one flock, but that doesn't mean we always look like the other person. Let me give you the key phrase of tonight. The call of Israel was to bring the message of salvation to the Gentile world. And so you can see that the Gentiles were always included in the salvation plan of God. You should never feel as a Gentile believer, oh, I'm not Jewish and there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. God did not make a mistake. He created you perfectly. He gave you a destiny. And the plan of salvation for which he called Israel to, its whole purpose was to go save the Gentiles. Because the Gentile nations were always in the eyesight of God, always wanting to bring them to his family. They're not of lesser value. They have the same value as everyone else. It's called distinctive value. You can be of equal value but have different callings. It's like a husband and a wife. Distinctive value. Let me summarize. The word Gentile In different parts of the Bible, it can mean pagan, and we saw them called pagan babblers. It can mean those not worthy of being associated with. And those are some of the negative terms we read tonight. But there are positive terms of the word Gentile also used in scriptures. Those of the other sheep pen. Those of the wild olive shoot. Those that were once considered unclean, but are now considered clean because of the blood of Yeshua. God has called the Gentiles to his kingdom to a full inheritance, lacking nothing. There's no difference in the inheritance that a Gentile believer receives from a Jewish believer. They're gonna both receive the same inheritance. And once the Jewish people were identified as the chosen, they were chosen for a task. And because the Jewish people were once the least of all the people, they were to then be used to bring the truth of God's salvation to the rest of the non-Jewish world. And for a time, the Jews looked down upon the Gentiles as we read in the New Testament. But it was Yeshua who elevated the Gentile into his full inheritance, going on to call the Gentile believers his children, co-heirs with the Messiah. He called the Gentiles heirs of his kingdom, Do you know he even called the Gentile believers the royal priesthood in a holy nation? Gentile believers too have a perfect created destiny by God. Now listen. I don't want anybody to ever have an identity crisis. For the many Jewish people in the house tonight, that's a wonderful calling of God. You have responsibilities. You have covenantal heritage that you must walk out. Those in the house tonight, also watching online, maybe you're not Jewish. You're from a Gentile background. That is also an excellent calling. You've been given a commission. You've been given a destiny and an inheritance. 
Each one is called to bring Yeshua's salvation to the other group. Thus, no one can become conceited. And shall I end with, no one should become insecure in your calling. Because there's not one better than the other. Yeshua doesn't elevate one and diminish another. He only elevates the outcast, the sick, the poor, the imprisoned, the women, the children, the slaves, the servants, Israel, and now the Gentiles. Let's pray. Father, we honor you. And what we see through tonight's lesson is the amazing extent of your love, how much you love the nations. So you prepared a special group of people trained in evangelism to go take your truth to the nations. That the chosenness of the, the Jewish people is a chosenness of a job description to bring salvation to the world. Thank you, Lord, tonight that you have healed hearts, you've healed insecurities, you've broken barriers, you've brought truth, that there are two wonderful branches connected in this olive tree, that there are two wonderful sheep pens right next to each other, and the same shepherd rules over both of them, that there are two groups receiving a full inheritance, there are two groups being called a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and that they support one another effectively for your ultimate goal, which is the salvation of the world. Thank you, Lord, for what role we play, regardless of what sheep pen we're in tonight. Let us not be conceited nor insecure. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen.